Now that we've done two proportions, it's time that we look at two means. Um, this example is from StatsMedic. We're going to be looking at the mean score on an AP statistics exam, and we're comparing two different forms. So here we have the students at Kentwood, East Kentwood High School. Um, they have 30 students take the exam, 15 get Form A, 15 get Form B. Um, take a moment, calculate the average from each of those sets of tests. Okay, so for the students who took Form A, we had an average of 4.2 pretty good. And then for form B, average of a 4. Still good, um, but the difference in those means is 0.2. And if you were paying attention in the last couple videos, then you can already see where we're going with this. Um, the last couple videos we looked at two proportions. Um, today we're going to be looking at two means. So just like with proportions, we're going to be subtracting um, our x-bar from one group and our x-bar from another group. In this example, our two groups are the form A tests and the form B tests. Now, um, before we get started, what we're going to do is assume that the two forms are the same difficulty. So let's just pretend um, if Doug scored a 5 on form A, he would have scored a 5 on form B. It did not matter which form he was given. We're working under this assumption that the forms are exactly the same. Does this remind you of a significance test? It should kind of remind you of a significance test. So. Before we get to actual significance tests or confidence intervals, we want to think about the sampling distribution of x bar A minus x bar B. So I have a Google Sheet here. I have the 30 scores represented. I want you to follow the directions in the Google Sheet to randomize the forms. If there really is no difference between form A and form B, we should just be able to shuffle everyone's scores. You know, the person who got a 3 on form A is going to get a 3 on form B. It doesn't matter which form they're given. So what we'll do is we'll shuffle around the data and then we'll recalculate the mean for the forms form A and form B. I just want you to do that a couple times to make sure you understand what's happening and then I'll show you how to do a larger scale simulation. So just do number one and number two now. Pause the video and then do number one and number two. All right, so you can see here I did it once. Um, the new mean for form A was 3.93, so much lower this time. Form B, 4.27. So this time the difference is actually negative. We went in the complete opposite direction and even more extreme in the opposite direction. All right, now you can do that many times on your own, but we're gonna get there faster if we use an applet. So I'm gonna show you, um, I will have this linked to the correct applet here, but I'll show you what to do. Okay, so the first thing you'll wanna do is change the number of groups to two, um, and then you can just type in the data. Um, group one will be form A, group two will be form B, and you're just typing in the numbers straight from your notes. Click Begin Analysis, and then you can skip over this middle part, it's just the summary statistics. Go down to Perform Inference, and you're going to click here and change this to Simulate Difference in Two Means. All right, now if you just start by putting in one sample, you do Perform Simulation. This is doing exactly what the spreadsheet did for you a moment ago. It's reshuffling all the students into Form A and Form B, calculating the means of Form A and Form B, and then subtracting the mean of A minus the mean of B, plotting that right here. Oh my god, we got 0.2. What are the odds of that? I love asking what are the odds of that. I'm a statistics teacher. Like I'm not, act, don't, don't find the odds of that. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is get at least 100 samples. Um, you don't have to go by ones. You could type in 99 right now and then you'd get 100 samples total. It'll just keep adding to what you've already clicked. So get at least 100 samples, then come back here, make a sketch, and see if you can answer questions four and five on your own. Hint, it's going to be very similar to significance test logic that we've done in the past. Pause the video and do that now. Um, I'm just using my computer, so I just screenshotted. Uh, here's what my simulation looked like. This is 100 trials. So East Kentwood had a difference of mean scores of 0.2. Is this outcome surprising if we assume both forms are the same difficulty? All right, so point two looks to be about here. Yeah, it must be this one. Well, point two looks really likely to happen, and also anything greater than point two seems pretty likely to happen, and the applet will actually calculate this for you. If you tell it what you're interested in, like count the number of dots greater than or equal to point two, yeah, 41 of the dots in my simulation are greater than or equal to point two. That's 41%. So 41% of the time in this simulation, we got a difference of 0.2 or greater. And that is not very unlikely at all. It's fairly likely that we get a difference of 0.2 or greater. So 
If we come down here to number four, no. Assuming the forms are the same difficulty, there is about a 41% chance of getting a difference of 0.2 or greater. Now this will obviously be different for each person who does the simulation because simulation is random. Your results probably won't look exactly like mine. You'll likely say no as well, but your number won't be the same. And then number five, based on the simulation, do we have convincing evidence that one form of the exam is harder? No, it's pretty likely to get a difference of 0.2 or greater, 41%, pretty likely. So there is not evidence that one form was harder than the other. If only 5% or less than 5% of the differences were greater than 0.2, then maybe we'd have evidence that one test is harder than the other. All right, now this simulation, minus here, was an approximate sampling distribution of the difference of x bar a and x bar b. So in general, here's what we know about the sampling distribution of x bar a minus x bar b. Let's start with shape. Okay, well, there's actually a lot to this one. <laughs> The shape of the sampling distribution will be approximately normal if, and then there's three different things you can check. The easiest one is if you know the population was normal, and really here I should have put plural populations. You would need both populations to be normal, and then you would know that the sampling distribution of x bar a minus x bar b would be approximately normal. But as I've said many times, if you knew something about the population, why would you need to do inference? So it's not super likely that you'll know the populations are normal. The second thing you could check would be n greater than or equal to 30. And once again, I should have put plural n's here because both sample sizes have to be larger than um, 30. This is by the CLT like we've done in the past. Now, if you don't have that, you can get away with saying there are no strong outliers or skew. Um, you would have to support that statement with a box plot or a dot plot of the two samples. And if you do need a refresher on that, I have a video if you go to my um, YouTube page under Calculator How-Tos. There's a video on how to make box plots, so you don't have to do it by hand. Okay, center, real easy. The center of our sampling distribution would just be the mean from the first distribution minus the mean of the second distribution. I just realized I switched to 1 and 2 instead of A and B. You get it. <laughs> All right, and then for spread, this is a lot. Let's look at the formula sheet. Oh my god, I have so many tabs open. This is what my brain is like. It's like 20 different tabs for statistics and then one tab on how to make mole. Okay, so we look at the second page of the formula sheet and we have sampling distributions for means and then we have two populations here. So here's the mean that we just talked about, mu1 minus mu2. Here's the standard deviation. And here is the standard error. If you don't know the true standard deviation of the two um, original distributions, you use S, the standard deviation from the samples. Once again here, we're not simply adding standard deviations. We are adding variances and then taking the square root. But you don't have to remember that. You can just look at the formula sheet. <laughs> so there's a formula. We have to have the 10% rule met in order to use that formula. OK, now the rumor has spread. And the College Board is noticing a lot of Reddit threads about how one form of the AP Statistics test is harder than the other. So they decide to investigate the claim that one test was harder than the other, and they select an SRS of 100 Form A's and 100 Form B's. They get the following statistics, and you can copy these down onto your paper. Now what we're going to do is construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the true difference in scores on Form A and Form B. This is a four-step process question, and I think you have the tools to do pretty much all of it. So what I want you to do is pause the video, just try state plan do conclude, see how far you get before you have a question, and then when you get stuck, hit play and we'll go through the four steps together. Okay, so for the state step, this is really similar to what we were doing in the previous videos. We will estimate the true difference in scores on Form A and Form B with 95% confidence, and then I've clarified the difference we're looking at is A minus B. Plan step. Just like normal, we're checking random, normal, and independent. So for random, it does say that we have SRSs. Normal, we can assume the sampling distribution is approximately normal by the CLT because both sample sizes are greater than 30. You do have to check both, so just keep that in mind. And then independence, I think it's safe to assume that more than a thousand students took each form of the test. Okay, now you can see the start of an arrow here, but before we get to that, 
we don't know the true standard deviation of the populations. If we did, we would not need to do this confidence interval. So we are going to construct a two sample t interval. Okay, it just occurred to me that the College Board probably would know. And this example doesn't really make sense. The, co <laughs> the College Board would know the true mean from both forms. They wouldn't need to take a sample. I, I don't know. We're out here now. We're just going to keep going. Just for whatever reason, the College Board doesn't know the true mean or the true standard deviation of their own test. But anyway, because we don't know the true standard deviation of the populations, we're going to construct a two sample t interval. So many things happening here. Two sample, because we've got the two different populations. T, because we don't know the true standard deviation. And interval, we're not doing a test, we are constructing an interval. So two sample T interval. Okay, now we can see where that arrow is pointing. I just did the calculation for standard error. So once again, I'm looking at the formula sheet. Um, I don't know the standard deviation of the populations, so I'm using this formula over here. Okay, now this is where you might have gotten stuck. 95% confidence, that would put 2.5% in each tail. Um, I need to find my t star value, so I'm using inverse t. The area under the tail is 0.025, and for degree of freedom, I'm using 99. You might want to make a note to yourself, the degree of freedom to use is the smaller of the two degrees of freedom. Now actually, there is a formula to calculate degree of freedom. It's very simple, let me show it to you. Ah yes. So simple, so straightforward. It will only take you mere seconds. Yeah, technically this is how you calculate degree of freedom. You'll notice this is not on your formula sheet because who in their right mind would do this by hand? I actually did tutor a student once who was taking a college stat class who needed to do this by hand. It was a nightmare. Now picking the smaller degree of freedom is technically not the best degree of freedom, like we're, we're way rounding down, but it's good enough. It's gonna get us to our answer well enough. Normally we would use technology to calculate an exact degree of freedom, but for our purposes in this class, just use the smaller degree of freedom from your two ends. So in this case, both ends were 100, so we're just going to use 99. All right, so in general, for our confidence intervals, we're doing estimate plus or minus, mm, minus, there we go, the critical value times the standard error. I plugged all that in. Here's my interval. And the last step, of course, is to conclude. We are 95% confident that the true difference in scores on form A versus form B is between 0.1237 and 0.1736. All right, last question. Based on your confidence interval, is there convincing evidence that one form is harder than the other? Okay, well, we got two positive numbers. So let's just think through everything that could happen here. If we happen to get negative, comma, and then a positive number, that would mean that A minus B could be zero. So there's a chance that A is equal to B. That's not what happened here. If we happen to get two negative numbers, that would guarantee that A minus B has to be negative. And if A minus B is negative, that would mean that B is larger. That means form B, the scores were better. Also not what happened here. <laughs> what we had was positive comma positive. In that case, A minus B has to be a positive number. That means that A scores have to be higher. So form A scores must be larger than form B scores. So to answer this question, um, is there convincing evidence? Yes, zero is not in the interval. So there is convincing evidence that one form is harder than the other. In this case, it looks like the form A scores are higher, which probably means form A is easier. Making yourself a little cheat sheet, basically, of what the minus plus, minus minus, and plus plus mean can be really helpful when you're making conclusions like this. Like, you don't really need it for your conclude step, but a follow-up question, I find this really helpful. Okay, so just one more thing. If you are using a calculator to do this problem, it kind of depends on who your teacher is, if they want you to use a calculator or not. If your calculator asks you if you're doing a pooled T interval, just say no. We are not pooling. At no point are we going to pool. Don't pool, just say no.